What Drives You is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Yeah. Welcome to What Drives You. I'm your host, Kevin Miller, and thank you for joining me as I talk with today's most influential change makers to uncover what truly drives them and extract the big takeaways from their insights so you can integrate that wisdom and leverage the power of your unique inner drive and wake every day to your authentic, driven, and inspired self. In this episode, I am back with Dr. Neha Sangwan, our expert for this series on burnout. Of course, now we're going to dig into what drives her and the seven key areas of life. Neha, again, she's an MD, an engineer, CEO, communication specialist, and the author of Powered by Me. That's the muse for this series. Uh, Powered by Me, from burned out to fully charged at work and in life. You can connect with her at Intuitive Intelligence. Inc.com. And, uh, you know, I'm eager to hear, we talked so much, Neha, in the first segment about values. Uh, you listed those out and actually gave your values. I actually typed them out and wrote them down here uh, as uh, love, integrity, service, uh, and beauty. Did I get them right? Yeah. Beauty and play. The last one's play. 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 Okay. Which we're going to end on that one. So <laughs> I greatly appreciate that. Uh, so as we go through, and you talked about values. I mean, that's the point of this, what drives you in each area. And I always define that as what are your values and then how are you walking that out your daily habits and whatnot. So let's, uh, hit it off with spiritual. That's our first category here. Tell me what drives you in the spiritual aspect of your life. So that one does come under love, love and spirituality to me is about connection uh, it's about community. It's about love, support, family. It's about the family you get to choose, which is your friends. Um, I really, even when I have to do something hard, when I need to let someone go, when I feel disappointed, my question is always, can I do it from love? Hmm. And I find that when I do that, if it even, without me even knowing, it comes back um, to me in spades. Like even if I'm letting someone go, but I'm helping them find where they need to go, I'm giving them a reference, I'm making some phone calls, I'm trying to help them get where they want to be. What I find in the end is they are so, they bring me clients, they refer people to me, like just my behavior at times when it doesn't seem natural of love. Um, has always served me. So what drives me, first of all, the way I think of spirituality, so I think of it as what matters most to me. What what gets me excited and inspired and jazzed and and what touches me deeply and how, where in the world Am I willing to trust myself in order to take risks and go into the unknown? Wow. How, where am I not willing to take risks? And where do I play small? Um, spirituality to me is our interconnectedness. Yeah. Um, that when we breathe out, a tree breathes in. So it's... It's the interconnectedness of us as humans and living beings, plants, animals. To me, spirituality is really that visible and invisible connection uh, of how we all may look and feel different and have different aspirations, values, uh, et cetera, but really we're, we're all connected. Okay. What matters most to me? Um that hits that core aspect to me of, yeah, there's yeah. more to, there's more to it than me, more to life than me. Mm -hmm. I really like you saying that. I haven't mean, thought about it that way. Where do I trust myself to go into the unknown? I mean, that strikes me as that's the essence of faith. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's really, listen, this is where innovation is born and we, we need nothing right now if we don't need innovation, right? We're world changing really quickly, uh, the name of the game, pivoting and innovating. And so 
it's really about self-trust. And spirituality to me is about self-trust. It's about where will I take risks? So for me, mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually, and financially, entrepreneurially, I'll take risks. Mm -hmm. But I got crushed pretty early in my life around love. And so romantically and physically, like you don't find me jumping out of airplanes and bungee jumping and climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Like it's just not my thing. So physically, I don't take as many risks. And romantically, until you know a few years ago, I didn't take very many risks. And so if I tell you where I take risks and where I don't take risks, right away, you know where I trust myself and where I don't. Mm -hmm. And when you trust yourself, you're willing to go into the unknown and explore the mystery there. You're willing to try things outside of your comfort zone. And to me, how and whether we venture into the unknown and mystery and awe, to me, that's spirituality. Agreed. That's an interesting way to put it. And it's interesting with that in looking at spirituality being a belief in something greater than self that you still put so much of the impetus initially, at least on self, self-trust. Yes. Oh, yeah. Because to me, when you ask yourself the question, you know, when everything falls apart, when things are not what you know, I mean, as a doctor, I almost think this happened to 75, 80% of my patients. They never thought they were the 50 or eight year old status post heart attack, the person who was going to get a cancer diagnosis. What? And I watched in that moment how it cracked open their heart to a whole new way of being. And then it was about what do you have faith in? Is it science? Is it the next generation? Is it humanity? Is it me as your doctor? Is it this unknown person who just showed up at your bedside? Right? What do you have faith in? That's sometimes it's someone's religion, their faith, literally. Right? But whatever it is, uh, spirituality to me is about the unknown, mystery, awe. It's about our interconnectedness. It's about things we can't see, but sometimes we can feel when you get the goosebumps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in an experience or like, it's really about navigating the unknown mystery and in our interconnectedness. Okay. So I'll ask you uh, from a personal standpoint, that aspect of entering into mystery, entering into the unknown and, and, and into awe, especially, you know, are there things that you employ, embrace in your life to enter into that arena? I do. Um, so I'd say, uh, breathing. Uh, breathing to me is a place that can center and ground my physiology and can even really uh, have me feel uh, so peaceful, so grounded. It's a place where I can actually shift from being focused on the outer world mm -hmm. to being present in the inner world. And when I'm focused on the outer world, I'm usually like, oh, why did I do that? I'm regretting something. I'm in the past. I'm in the future. But when I breathe, it's like the one place that I can feel gravity pulling me down and I could just be in my body. Otherwise, I'm a doer as well. And I just start going into motion. So it brings me peace. Um, what I would say is uh, I like candles. Mm. Um, sometimes when I'm not a big like still meditator, like I don't I don't just sit and everything goes peaceful. I'm kind of an active meditator. So I dance <laughs> and I just let my body move in ways that are not pretty, but um, get anything out of me. So more like shaking and dancing. Uh, that's one way I tap into uh, my spirituality. I love journaling. Uh, that really helps me. I'm much more audio visual and written. So sometimes even when I'm talking to you, uh, if I could, I would have been, you know, typing notes and putting it in the chat and all of these things that often helps me really integrate things. The other place where I get spirituality, and this is going to seem weird, but is my intuition comes through me when I'm talking to you, talking, mm -hmm. connecting to someone. So when I write my books, I have to talk them out. Hmm. And I talk, so an editor will ask me a question and I'll say, oh, the reason those two things are connected and all of a sudden as it starts coming through me, I would just start typing because that's how my own intuition comes to me. So you, 
I also spoke to you about the physical sensations in my body. Mm -hmm. That's how I get my intuition. So I can feel things now. This is going to sound a little weird or silly, but just left of center, when I am in the presence of someone that's like a really high energy, like almost a spiritual energy, just left of center, I can feel energy moving up through my body. And all of a sudden, whenever that happens, I'm like, Neha, pay attention. Pay attention because there's something of a higher energy vibration going on here. So those are some of the ways that I tune in. Um, I'm a seer, and so I'm nonlinear. So routine would probably help me, but I am not the person who gets up first thing in the morning, does my meditation and my workout, and I'm more like when I feel lost, I use some of the things I've spoken to you about to reground me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I resonate with you on that. I have a hard time with routine as a fellow seer with that. It's interesting your intuition and talking about connecting because uh, that's when I have some of my biggest epiphanies doing this right here, doing it, not just a chit chat talk, but when we're sitting here talking about something intentionally and digging into it, it, I just, why I love it. I can't believe that I actually get paid to do this. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, well, let me take you next into relationships, which you hit on, and I'm actually going to deviate from the norm of just going right into what motivates or what uh, drives you and ask that you said that that's one where you had a hard, you had some hard things happen and that was not an area of risk for a while. Can I dig in there a little bit with you? You bet. So when I was a little being three months old in, in the Indian culture, uh, everybody hands children like around to the extended family. They don't think anything of it. Like an aunt raises a child of another sister or brother. Grandparents take kids for years. Like it's just this cultural thing. So when I was three months old, my grandfather got stationed in Africa uh, for the United Nations. And he was on a few year assignment and he called my grandmother. He said, I can do the work, but you got to do all the socializing. I need you to come to Africa. She scooped me up at three months old. Everybody thought it was a good idea. Off I go for two years with my grandparents. Well, you can imagine three months to two years old. At two years old, I just thought they were my parents. So when my family came to pick me up, uh, I don't think I stopped crying for more than a, like a month. Wow. And everybody, they were 20-something years old, my parents themselves. I mean, they didn't really know the impact of what that was going to be. So I come into a family where I have a three and a half year old sister who just gets a two year old sister who thinks she's an only child. So she thinks she's an only child and I think I'm an only child. So I'm not like an adorable baby who's helpless and floppy that she can mold. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want me around and she doesn't want me around. She doesn't realize this, of course, but she's needing to split love with her parents now. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't think anybody thought of it. Uh, they thought they were doing something lovely for me. And I will tell you, here's the bonus. For the rest of my life, my grandparents like could not get enough of me, right? Like they raised me. So that was a good side of it. But I started getting bullied. And so my older sister, as she bullied me, um, my parents couldn't really hear it. Like they would, they would really say like, you girls are sisters, you need to work it out. Well, that doesn't really work when you're getting bullied. Wow. And so my uncle, Mukamama, he saw me, my mom's brother, and he was like, stop that. He was like, yeah, you better stop doing whatever you're doing to your sister. And so I felt so connected to him. And I think I started to think of him and more as my dad um, because I was confused. I was lost. I didn't really understand. So I attached to him and I thought he saw me and valued me. So when I'm 10, he dies in a plane crash. And so this little girl learns very quickly don't love something too much because when you do, it goes away. Yeah. And the, my older sister, who I thought would protect and love me, was the one who felt threatened by me, my presence. And so everything started getting mixed up for me where love wasn't safe and it, wasn't, it didn't make sense. It felt slippery. It felt like I didn't understand the rules. Um, and so then, you know, I'm 16, 17 years old, and um, I had my first boyfriend then, and wow, uh, I felt like we connected physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, all of it. We were really 
And my older sister thought he was so amazing that suddenly I became cool. If this guy likes her, so I didn't just find love and someone who saw me and valued me and appreciated me uh, and helped me undo the things. You're too ugly. You're too dark. You're, you're not, you know, all your hair's too curly. You're frizzy. All the nonsense. He, he saw all through all of it. And then what he did was he united me and my sister because my sister thought he was so cool. She wanted to hang out with us. And so we, I got that experience of everything together. And then when they all went off to college, they were a year older than me um, and everything changed. And uh, I did some silly things. I think I was too afraid. I think I was flirting with someone else uh, right before he was leaving for college when he walked in and saw me doing it. Um, Not because I liked the other person, but now I understand I was so subconsciously afraid of being left again that I thought, well, when you guys leave me, somebody at least is going to think, I'm, you know, awesome. And so I think when we don't understand what drives us, we actually create our own greatest pain. Um, And then after that, boy, I dated men who, ambitious men who were emotionally unavailable. And that was the next almost 30 years. And I really didn't get over that until my mid 40s. And it's it. What I did very much was shut down, and um, that wasn't safe. So why don't I just do what's safe, which is, I know I can work hard. I know I can get good grades. I'm athletic. I'm academic. Stay in that lane. Yeah. And I didn't take any risks. And what changed it? Um, a silly uh, move of uh, dating someone who was really unavailable. Let's just put it that way, and waking up and realizing that this is dysfunctional, that I am working on my own self-awareness and transparency in my friend circle. I've cleaned that up. My work environment, I've cleaned that up. My family boundaries, I've cleaned that up. Ooh, I haven't gone to this love thing. And I made choices that were out of alignment with what I valued. And as soon as I realized that, I said, no, this is the next concentric circle. So I put myself in, this is embarrassing, but it's true, an eight-year, like, you have to sit in the corner and learn to love yourself and respect yourself enough so that you can teach other people how to treat you. And I did self-compassion, self-love practices. I made sure I could be alone. Um... And about eight years later, it was my assistant, Katie, who one day said to me, she was 27, she said to me, Neha, I just put uh, your profile up on Bumble. (laughs) I said, you did what? And she said, yeah, I'm going to be on. And I thought if you and I were both on, we could spend like a half an hour at the beginning of the day and a half an hour at the end of the day, and it'll be fun. We'll do it together. And by the way, you're too fun and too cool to be single. So I did it for you. And I remember laughing so hard. Like, I hadn't laughed that hard uh, in a long time. And she made a decent profile. And I was like, Katie, you're amazing. Because I don't think I would have found the courage to do it without you. So we okay. did it. And we started dating. And uh, and now I've been in a relationship for five years. Okay. So to, so to take that, then thank you for the story now. Uh, so to take that, what would you say? Okay. So now, uh, coming from that, I, I appreciate the context. To say, okay, this is what I value when I'm looking for relationships now. How would you define that? Well, I value myself. And I know that how I treat myself is how I teach people to treat me. So that, um, that was, I was never even in the equation. Everything was about serving other people, pleasing other people, being a healer and, and being there to help other people in their time of need. But I never realized that the integrity of loving myself, um, having self-compassion so that I'm not self-critical when I make a mistake allows me to give grace to whoever I'm with. And by the way, loving myself allows me to let someone in. Because when I don't love myself and someone else loves me, I actually think something's wrong with them. I think something's wrong with them because I think it might be just until they figure out that it's 
that like I'm really not all that. Yeah. I feel almost like an imposter uh, in the first in the early years of my um, dating, and now I feel that when someone mistreats me, I will stand up for me. And so what I do is I actually carry. Um, I'm going to actually uh, ask my assistant. She'll do. She'll do it uh, shortly. But um, I'll ask her to bring in. There's a little picture of my younger self at two when I was crying uh, that I look into her eyes whenever I have a hard decision to make, like breaking up with someone or things aren't going well or what do I have to do? And I, I always side with her because for the middle part of my life, I used to leave her to belong to other people. And now I know that even if something doesn't work out, me and her, as long as we're together, we're never alone. Thank you. This is beautiful. Um, that aspect, that's worth its weight in gold. I hope somebody, including myself, hears that and embraces that, that you valuing yourself. That is how you teach other people to treat you. And of course, the converse then of that is we are surrounded continually in relationship with people who are mistreating us. What does that say about us? Um, thank you. And, and I, I don't know what your, if you have a resource, but on the, when you talk about self-care, self-compassion, I first think about somebody we had on the show. It's been a long time ago, Dr. Christine Neff. Is it, uh, you know, I just went to dinner with her on Thursday night. I just, really? I met her in Austin and we had such a delightful dinner. She's been one of my yeah. uh, guiding lights okay. and we happened to meet each other at a conference we were both speaking at in DC. And I just said to her, at the risk of being a fangirl, I already signed a book to you. I'd love to give it to you, and I'd love to connect to you. And she said, why don't we go to dinner when you're down uh, in Austin? So okay. she, she's amazing. Okay. Beautiful. Well, maybe I'll hit you up then, Enrique. It's been a long time. Again, I had to drum her name up, and I still think of her with compassion, but I bet it's been five years or more yeah. since we had her on. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, health and wellness. Uh, Neha is the next one there. So when you look at your own health and wellness, and the next one after that is mental. So I kind of separate that out. So this is a little more of a physiological look, health and wellness. Tell me about you or what drives you there. What are your values there? Well, this one is amazing because what I was, I taught, I was taught in my training, um, was eat when you can pee, when you can sleep, when you can, your own biology is secondary to anything emerging in the hospital. Uh, when I was young, uh, my mom's a gardener and a cook. I think I was like allergic to the kitchen and anything related. Now I love her food. She's an incredible cook. So I was the great recipient of my grandmother and my mother's gardening and cooking. Yeah, I love the food, but I never wanted to be in the kitchen. I never cared about nurturing me. And, um, I had to get sick myself. Uh, six years ago, I got a parasite. I picked it up somewhere on my travels. And boy, it stripped the lining of my gut. And I had more than 200 food sensitivities as a result. Wow. And my face, huge lesions down my face, white blotches all over my body. And I have to say, it was such an incredible wake-up call. I had an autoimmune uh, reaction and food sensitivities. And now I get it. Now I get it. I get that whole piece about health, uh, wellness, uh, not just let's not be sick, but let's not be mediocre, like kind of feeling not kind of lethargic, heavy, tired, intermittent headaches. No, no, no. Let's talk about optimal wellness, being fully charged. And to me, what drives me there uh, now? I have an incredible diet. Uh, it's been six years since the parasite, and I might have one lesion left here that's healing. Um, I never knew I had the discipline that has come. I am off sugar, off dairy, off gluten. I am off eggs, corn, and bell peppers. I mean, that a human can actually travel the world and be gluten free, vegan, and all of these things. I didn't even think I could do it. So yeah. what I what I believe uh, is is the integrity of health is about the unique listening to your body and knowing what 
it's feedback is for you. For some people, meat, they don't feel full without meat. For me, I feel sick if I eat it. So it's really about each of us uniquely tuning in to what our body needs, when it needs it, and having the discipline to make choices when it gives us feedback. Ah, goodness. We ask you on the <clears throat> movement side, exercise, anything you're- oh, That's my hardest one. So, you know, Kevin, this, this might just be a story I made up about it, but when I was little and I told you that I came back from Africa um, and I was crying and crying and crying and crying and nothing was going to get me my grandparents back, I think I disconnected from my body. Hmm. And I think without knowing it consciously, I think this little girl decided it was not safe to feel. And I think that was when I went into my head. And from then on, I was going to do academics. I was going to do athletics. And the kind of athletics where you push through your body, you don't partner with it. That kind of extreme. Because I could get accolades, connection, recognition, appreciation. And hopefully people, I wouldn't do something wrong so nobody would send me away again. Right? So I think... I disconnected from my body. And when I work out, it's about being back in my body. And I think my struggle there is um, not only is it being back in my body, but it's making my body uncomfortable and ripping muscles and being sore afterwards and having this really big presence in my body. And I think that's why it's really hard for me. Gosh. Uh, but what I've figured out so far, I got a, I got a trainer and if I do it with others and if I can, that motivates me because I don't miss, I don't miss working out when I do it with others. So I need that added accountability buddy. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. that is my big growth edge. No, I appreciate and 24 is going to be that. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that. Well, and that, that fits into, you know, what you said relationally and even spiritually about community and connectedness that, that helps foster that. And that, that statement of, you said it in regards to athletics, but how often do we physically think of it as pushing through instead of partnering? It's a great perspective. And I have to tell you, we were talking about the interconnectedness of everything. Yeah, I know all the information. Like when you work out, you have something called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine with three phosphates. When you work out, it breaks apart the adenosine and the three phosphates and the adenosine goes up to your brain and helps you sleep better. So when you move your body, you sleep better. Like even that's all connected, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. I do painfully. Neha. So you, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you don't know this. I Right now I am uh, at about five weeks post the biggest uh, accident I've ever been in. So I'm, I'm a, been a lifetime athlete, was a pro cyclist and had the biggest bike wreck of my life on a big adventure with some guys. So I'm here five weeks uh, with uh, uh, seven broken bones um, oh right now. So uh, all over the place. So I, but I can't exercise. I mean, I can walk is the extent of it. So at, from being an almost daily, pretty vigorous, you know, exerciser all my life to five weeks of nothing. And my sleep is crap. My sleep is complete junk all my stats my heart rates up my you know all my all my little wearable data is terrible and it's the greatest uh an analogy of that of, of how movement how exercise benefits our sleep my digestion's off i mean everything's right. off now it may be more acute with me because i was so avid on that side yeah holy smokes yeah with sleep right there it's just my body doesn't quite know what to do and it wakes up at four is kind of what my body wants to do now I really don't care to wake up at four. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. Okay. Work, business, uh, career. Tell me about your drives in relation to that. So in the last five years, um, I've gotten a framework for what I believe in. And that's amazing because I think I was just doing this on my own, but now I have a framework for it. So it's called conscious capitalism. So I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and these pillars of conscious capitalism really drive me. The first one is you have to have a purpose higher than profit. 
You have to have something that matters. If it's just about the money, uh, I think when you get there, it's going to be a little empty. Yeah. The second one is stakeholder integration, which means every decision I make in work, in my business, has to be made not just like shareholders in mind, like how much money is that going to make? How is that the bottom line? But more like, who is this decision going to impact? Who are all the stakeholders? And when I put them down, I put down what they value about this and whether it's high, medium, or low impact. Mm -hmm. And then I work to figure out a way where everybody matters and everybody can win. And then the third pillar in my work is conscious leadership, that me and everyone I am with uh, is working to become a more conscious leader because our rate limiting step is whoever is not. So our job is to keep elevating together and then creating a conscious and caring culture, um, which means I take my highest values for me, for the company, and I build everything I do on those pillars, my people practices, how I hire, how I let go of people. Does that align with my highest values? My, the way that I measure productivity, does that align with what I value? How I create policies and norms, how does that align with what I say I value? And most of all, how do I measure performance? And does that align with what I say is most important to me? And if those do, I really can create prosperity for everybody. And is there a way that business can be this place of healing for the people who are there, a force of healing for those we serve, uh, and kind of a like a, a source of healing for those we serve and a force of healing in the world is really what I would say. And so that's my goal. My goal in whatever I create is that it really, yes, it is profitable uh, because that's responsible, um, but that it is also this, this real force of healing in the world. And that, I love the overview on conscious capitalism. And yeah, it, I am curious also then just from a, not that that wasn't a heart level, but from a heart level, when you wake up in the morning, as we talk about waking up driven and inspired, what is it that is just kind of gives you the gumption to do what you do here and to devote yourself to this, to, to talk to people about burnout and not yeah. just business in essence? What is it yeah. that really jazzes you? Well, I will tell you, I believe that true purpose comes from our greatest wounds in life. And when we learn to heal those, if we can give that to the world, that will be our, our highest purpose and our calling. And so for me, I already explained to you, you know, the trauma that I had young at three months and two years old, followed by bullying for decades and loss. What I did was I shut down emotionally and communicatively. The world wasn't safe. So I just performed and got an A. Right. So it wasn't until my early 30, 30 years old that I'm graduating from medical school and residency and everyone else is on top of the world. I'm hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and depressed. And that was when I realized, oh my gosh, I, I went into my first self-awareness workshop. I realized I could navigate my emotions and express myself. As soon as I found the ability to feel and express and communicate, boy, I knew I was going to be doing that for the rest of my life. And so I started heal. That was 25 years ago. And so I have been doing that work. And now I can see everywhere in the world as I've gone really deep in doing my own work and I continue to do it. I now can see how communication, navigating emotions, all of this can heal so many angles of the world. And so that's what I use now to serve others. So if I can help elevate collective consciousness, if I can give people a roadmap that if my pain can serve as somebody else's survival guide, like I'm in. And so that's what I get really excited about. Um, and the conscious capitalism piece was really that as I went into companies and I taught leaders, uh, they said to me, do you know there's a framework for what you do? And I said, no, I didn't know that. Um, and so it was helpful for me to know that it wasn't just, you know, Neha's I way. I love both. <laughs> I love both of them. It's kind of the head and the heart and, and both. And uh, I want to say it again, what you said, 
Uh, cause like you said, you, you, you like to take notes. I am. So true purpose comes from the greatest wounds in life. And if, if your pain, you said, if my pain can serve as somebody else's survival plan, really the lessons from my pain that I take the lessons from that pain and the, what I've learned and, and how I've healed myself. If I can, if those can be put into a way, a format, a book, a course, whatever it is to serve as the guide for someone else and help them save 30 years of their life and they do it instead in six months, yeah. that matters. Yeah, yeah. Money. Mm -hmm. uh, money, finances, wealth, however you want to look at it, even possessions. Tell me what drives you there. You, and I know you just talked about profit, uh, that profit's mm -hmm. responsible. I appreciate that. So tell me more. You bet. Well, let's just start with I like nice things. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, when I disconnected from my body, something I did, which I can even, I, this is cashmere and I noticed ever since I was a little girl, how sensitive I was to anything that touched me. Hmm. And so I've always wanted things to be soft and comfortable. And so I push myself so hard, 36 hour shifts and medicine and engineering and all of this stuff that I think what became really, really important to me was any chance that I could give this body comfort, that I could make it at ease, that became important. So money. Money was an interesting thing because I picked up my, my lessons around money more. Uh, my mom was really frugal and wanted us to like count everything. My dad was like, we don't have money, we don't have money. Boom, I'll give lots of money. We don't have, we don't have money. We don't. So it was like this wait a minute, like, how, how do we do this? And at some point, money, I needed it to pay loans back. I always had to do future gratification, like delayed gratification right. in medicine. You give up your 20s, you give up your youth, you do all these things for someday when, right? But I, I have been, money, I'm a little bit, um, I'm not as tight with money as my mom. I like to believe... I'm not quite my dad in this either, but what I would say is my relationship to money seems to flow with how I think about abundance. So I've found that when I give things away, they come back to me. And to me, money is just, um, it's about trading what I value, my hard work and energy for something else. And I think we get too caught up in it. And I think we think our self-worth equals our net worth. And money to me, what drives me is that I fairness, that I, that I think something's fair and that I value myself. Because early in my life, I would just, for the discomfort of money, I'd pick up the whole check because I don't want to deal with that discomfort. Now I'm more like, let's talk about it. What seems fair to you? I, I always want to make sure people, I underpromise and over deliver. Let's say you hire me to do something. I now charge uh, substantial rates. And so what I always want in the end is that someone feels that I underpromised and over delivered, yeah. even though when I say to them that I'm going to do something, uh, I, it's about value. It's about value. Hmm. Like, did was it a good value? Yeah. Ah, uh, goodness. All right. This is interesting because I've never done this before. Uh, okay. Uh, this is, I've been doing this format forever, but as you know, with the name change and the, the brand change of what drives you, I'm going to follow along in my book and do one. Uh, I'm still going to end the, the way I do, but I've never really done this, but it's just what I, in the book and looking at what drives people, achievements, okay. achievements is the last one, how we value our achievements and how they they, they do drive us, but I have never had it as part of the show until now. So I'll ask you uh, for the first time on this, that what drives you when you look at your achievements, at what you're looking uh, toward and, and maybe what drove you in the past for your past achievements and that may have changed. Mm, oh, it's changed so much. In the people pleasing phases of my life, which were the first three decades, three and a half, probably maybe four, I think I still do it sometimes. Um, my dad wanted a son who was an engineer. My mom wanted, missed her calling as a doctor. I, when I overheard that, 
thought, well, those two things aren't mutually mutually exclusive. Everyone can stop fighting. I'll take care of both of them. Mm -hmm. And so my achievement uh, in my young years was about getting love, affection, accolades from my parents, my grandparents, and the Indian community. It was all externally what people wanted from me, what they would think highly of me for. It was about meeting society's definition of success. Yeah. I have in the last, you know, 20 years really moved from achievement to fulfillment. And now what it feels like is, listen, when this book came out, you know, everyone's like, do you want it to be a New York Times bestseller and a Wall Street Journal? Like, sure. Like, why not? Like, that sounds amazing. And I worked really hard in every way I knew how to activate my network. I hired PR. I did everything that one would do. Um, I did not get on any of those lists on launch day. And what I'd say is, in the past, I probably would have been crushed, like I failed or, you know, whatever it is. And what I thought to myself was, oh, it sounds like this goal that I made wasn't exactly what the universe had in mind. My job is to get this in everybody's hands who's suffering that could benefit from it and is ready. Yeah. But if I focus too much on, it depends on whose achievement it is. Is it society's definition of what this is? Or is this really aligned with who I am? Yeah. And so I think achievement to me now uh, in the fulfillment world is whenever I think, quote, I failed in whatever, whatever endeavor, <clears throat> I think what I now think about is what was the lesson that I was supposed to get here? And the faster I learn this lesson, the quicker I get to graduate to the next lesson in life school. So I think of it more like we set these, these goals and achievements. They help us strive for something. Um, but I, I'm much more careful now not to conflate them with who I am, it's something I'm trying to do or achieve. And when it doesn't happen, I just don't get, I don't get us down on myself. I, I really just say, okay, I'm co-creating this with a whole universe. There's people, there's all these circumstances, situations. Maybe this wasn't the lesson I was supposed to get. Maybe it's something else. Goodness, that last part there, not, you know, not equating it with who you are. Yeah, it just reminds me of my achievements are not my self-identity and self-worth. That's, that's, I was going to say that's a, it's been a hard lesson, but as you kind of said before, it's, it's also a current lesson. It's an all, yeah. probably an always one. Um, thank yeah. you. I, well, I am going to end and, and I, and I appreciate it with you. I usually ask about personal interests and I'm looking for the things that you do that just inspire you. Uh, it may not be productive things in and of themselves. However, it's, not however, and it coincides and aligns with your values that you stated, your five values. Your last one is play. Tell me about it. Yeah. So I would say that I grew up quite a serious person because I had trauma early in my life. And um, I love humor. So you can always convince me to go to a Trevor Noah show, a comedy show, a uh, um, but here's the interesting thing. My older sister, she may have bullied me, but God, she was pretty funny. <laughs> and she instilled wit and humor uh, in my value system. Uh, so children, whenever I'm around children, I feel a license of freedom to play and just be silly. That's why I, I, I see the inspiration and, and the future in them. And so... I, I have to, this is hilarious, but I have to work on having more play in my life. And it's not what comes naturally, but boy, when it's there, like the dancing and, you know, whatever, uh, I feel glimmers of freedom that I know are really healing for me. I feel glimmers of freedom. Um, that's interesting. I, I it's, it's, uh, reminds me of a, a favorite favorite family movie of ours. We watch it every Christmas is family stone. And mm. 
in that okay. in that one, they there's a line where the guy says to the girl, like, you, "You've got a freak flag. You're just not flying it." And I hear, <laughs> and I and I hear I you say that. that. That I, I well, you drove me back to that with feeling glimmers of freedom when I play when yeah. I do that. I, like I almost uh, think sometimes, like I'm a little bit jealous of the people who just like are completely free, and I'm often drawn to it. Really, the other thing I really love uh, doing are you know, I mean, just binging shows, and and sometimes I I need them to have a lot of deep meaning, like This Is Us. I love that series, right? Um, and sometimes I just want it to be just silly and and fun. And so I kind of escape that way. I'm more audiovisual. So this is kind of funny, but I write books, but I don't really like reading books, <laughs> um, which is interesting. But I like listening to books and I like watching movies or having live experiences. So that's much more, much more me and it's much more fun. Oh, I appreciate that you write, but you don't read. That's okay. I'm a professional podcaster and I don't listen to podcasts because I, <laughs> uh, I just don't do auditory. I've got to read it. So I, thankfully, um, I'm digging the the AI that's out now that transcribes everything perfectly and stuff because now when somebody says, oh, you got to listen to the show, I can just go read it. But, uh, you know, oh, hey, thank you. This has just been a gift. I so am aware of and appreciate and am inspired by your intentionality, your intentionality and just your thoughtfulness with your life. Um, it's, uh, I think it'll be a gift. I'm eager for everyone to, to hear this and to learn more about you and get to know you. And, uh, and folks, I, I will again, say the book here, that is the muse here that, uh, that Neha puts so much of herself into is powered by me from burned out to fully charged at work and in life. You can connect with her at intuitiveintelligenceinc.com. And as you hear this episode, and again, I loved this one. It was so uh, personal and, and vulnerable, Neha. So if you hear this, give us a rating on Spotify, give us a review on Apple and mention this one. It lets us both know the value that you got out of it. You can see this, so you can see our interaction on YouTube, and we'll have a lot of clips out on social media as always at Kevin Miller CO. And if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive and hear a lot of the repeating messages that you heard here from uh, Neha, my book, What Drives You, you can find that on Amazon. And until next time, folks, stay driven. Yeah.